soothing as the jazz. Uh, welcome everybody to the Kelly Writers House um, and welcome to our, our YouTube audience as well, whether you're watching now or later. I guess whenever you're watching, it will be now. Uh, let's not think. <laughs> we, I'm so sorry. Uh, that is way too meta for uh, so I was, a Tuesday night. Uh, you know, we got some English majors in the room. So um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. Everybody, Rebecca is home in Philadelphia. Yay. So let's give, uh, first of all, a big round of applause to Rebecca for making the trip here, for coming back to the writer's house. Uh, you were here in 2018. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yep. When a different, a different world. Yeah. Um, but a, an amazing, I have such special memories from this place. This is like one of my favorite places I've ever done an event at and this was under construction and we were on the patio yes. and we had just yes. like little tea sandwiches for lunch. Yes. And I think we had, I think <laughs> we had it Philly style. So we had primo hoagies. Right. I, I, <laughs> I definitely made up the tea sandwich. Yeah, yeah, you know. I don't have any neurons we, from before the pandemic. <laughs> so like you, I could say anything right now and believe that it happens. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we, we keep it classy and we, we have, you know, primo hoagies when we, when we, get together here um but yeah you came that was soon after this book uh the first yeah. modern lost book which we also uh have copies of for sale back there uh when that came out in 2018 and now we're here to celebrate the second one the modern loss handbook uh which i'm gonna ask you in a moment to to read from this but um Maybe first, I'll just say, for, some of you know me, but if you don't, my name is Jamie Lee Jocelyn, and I, uh, I work here, and I teach here, and I advise here, and uh, the reason Rebecca and I have connected is one of the things I've gotten to do here is actually lead a podcast, host a podcast called Dead Parents Society, like and subscribe, um, <laughs> but uh, which is, of course, as you can figure, about writing about the loss of a parent, uh, primarily at a, at a young age. And um, I was in the you know first year or so of doing that that podcast when I learned about modern loss, um, and I learned about you, and I came and saw you uh, at Head House Books. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, you know, I think I had you sign this, and by in doing that, I said, "Oh, and by the way, the Kelly Writers House is really cool, and you could come, and it would be really fun, and we'll get hoagies." Oh. <laughs> and and it, you did, and then you've come back uh, uh, happily. And we yes. booked this like seven months ago. Yeah, remember this was like I was so excited that the book was coming out, and then I was like, "Where do I want? Oh, I really want to go to Kelly Writers yes. House. Like yes. that's and you were like the second thing that I Aww. booked, and it was yeah. for like. The book came out in, this one must have been in February. And yes. you're like, how about September? And right. I was like, amazing. If there's still a world, then I'll be there. Yeah. Because who knew? <laughs> and here we are. And yeah. we, we've done it. Um, so I think, as I said, I think maybe the best way to kind of kick things off will be to just have you read a little bit, because it is the writer's house. So we we want to focus, we always want to sure. focus on the writing itself. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so we, we were looking at this section earlier. You could read the whole, you know, okay. two and a half pages if so, you'd like. So Jamie Lynn had asked me to read um, some of the book, and I feel like I'm, I'm so sick of myself by now. And, like, you know, I was asked by my agent if I wanted to write something that was like a memoir, and I'm like, no one wants to read that. That's, like, so boring. And yet I ended up writing a lot about myself in here because I feel like when you're writing about grief and loss – you know, it's like you're not only the, the, you know, president of the hair club for men, you're also a member. And why would I be the person writing this or one of the many people writing about grief if I didn't have my own story to tell? So I weave a lot of my own experiences through here, um, but I'm sure we'll talk about that a little. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would love to read just a brief section that I wrote on the guiding principle for using this book. Um, because, you know, well, you'll see, it's very self-explanatory. And this is how I hope people use it. And please um, think about this against the backdrop of, of any hard times. Like, you may not be living with the death loss, but you've had hard things happen in your life. And just think about it like that. Mm -hmm. Guiding principle for using this book. Before you turn the page, may I suggest a bit of a mental shift? 
When it comes to facing hard things, our culture is obsessed with war metaphors. We just love to imply that if you care enough or fight hard or long enough, you'll vanquish the aggressor. You're so strong, people automatically assure someone dealing with a major health issue because they just don't know what else to say that sounds motivating. You'll win this battle. This is incredibly grating when it comes to framing how someone died. A person who dies from cancer is no less brave than one who doesn't. It's also grating because when we continue to promote this imagery of a battle cry and military strategy as the ideal way to tackle grief, we end up unwittingly absorbing part of the message. So when it's our turn, we buy into the myth that we can control things through strength and sheer willpower. And then it hits us that, wait, I'm forcing myself to push and push day after day, and I don't feel like I'm winning anything. Listen, if you keep on furiously powering through adverse situations, especially ones that will permanently alter your life and need to be viewed as a marathon instead of a sprint, eventually you're going to power yourself right off a cliff. There's no winning or losing in tough times, over most of which you only have so much control, by the way. There's no war. This isn't freaking desert storm. There's just doing and then waking up and doing again. The, t the pandemic has taught us that in spades. With that in mind, you know what I think is cooler than a war metaphor? A crab one. Just hear me out. First, did you know that the horseshoe crab is the most successful animal on earth? And that they aren't actually crustaceans, but just go with it because like this is the metaphor that I'd like to follow here. I won't go into all the fascinating details about how they've lasted 440 million years longer than humans, surviving asteroids, at least three ice ages, and sea level changes, or how they've developed a number of adaptations that allow them to not only survive, but also to thrive, including a primitive immune-like response to bacteria and a specialized assortment of appendages. But it's all pretty cool stuff. Now consider the sand crab. Their only real job is to grip tightly onto their bearings, which means they spend most of their time buried in shifting sand. They don't fight it. Instead, these teeny tiny creatures bend and shift by using flexible footwork, digging in and letting go as needed in order to maintain their balance. They keep going when they lose a limb, and sometimes they even grow it back. They find a way, always and no matter what. Finally, think about all the other crabs out there, from the ones on the beach to the mud crabs to the hermit crabs in a cage. Most move in any direction as needed, forward, backward, and some even sideways, depending on the situation. They don't, fo they don't try to follow any particular trajectory. They change course when something isn't working for them and decide pretty quickly when it isn't. In sum, you can't fuck with a crab. They're resilient, they get shit done, and they don't care if they look wonky while doing it. They just do it. Grief is different for everyone, even when we're mourning the same person. There are endless permutations and combinations to how our particular personalities weather grief over someone with whom we had a unique relationship. As such, we need to be a little flexible in order to stay quote unquote strong. Remember that strength looks like a lot of things, from powering through on some days to giving yourself space to collapse into a crumbled snotty heap on others. Remember that bravery can look like completely screwing it up or not getting it right and then just trying again. And remember that if something isn't resonating with you, you can always pivot and see what works better. Think like a crab. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you will all have dreams of crabs tonight. Right? I am sorry if you had plans to go out for like crab cakes or <laughs> something like that. Like you will not be able to do it. I promise you'll yes. feel so bad. Well, um, and, the, and the crab, <laughs> you, you refer back to the crab as the book goes on, which is, you yes. know, I think I, I enjoyed that motif. And then, um, and I, you know, I'm not trying, I'm not trying as hard as it might sound that I'm trying to, to get you all to buy this book, but I'm going to give you a, uh, a tip. In the very back of the book, there are stickers. There are. There are grief stickers. I don't know if we've ever had a we've book. We've created a genre. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's grief stickers. <laughs> and I don't, I've been at the writer's house for a long time. And I don't know that we've ever had the opportunity to, to offer a book with stickers in the back. So this is a special day. Is, <laughs> it's like but, slowly, you're like slowly, it's going to be like paint by stickers. Right. Like literally on Amazon, I cannot get the 
categorization of it says sticker book in brackets. And I keep emailing my publisher. publisher I'm like, no offense to sticker books, <laughs> but like there's one page of stickers and there's right. 253 pages of right. prose. So can we just like remove that? Cause like <laughs> it just is like a little bit misleading. And she's like, Amazon is a Amazon is Amazon. So right. like Amazon, if you're listening, can you take that categorization out? But there are stickers. There are stickers. And, and there's a, the reason I bring it up now is there's a crab sticker. Yes, so there is. you can, you, you too can, can have one, put your crab anywhere. Yeah. And then you'll know. Cause like when we see each other out in the world, you know, you'd be like, oh, crab sticker. Cool. Yes. Right. <laughs> I mean, I sent that, I sent that chapter to my editor and I, and, and the subject line was like, like, it's weird. Just read it. Yeah. I'm like, and then I just think I wrote like, I know it's weird, but I think it works because I really believed it. You know, I was just like looking, I was thinking about like how much I really can't stand. Like I really do get tired. I think Alex Trebek had died and they're like, he lost mm. his battle with cancer. Yeah. And like people still, they use that and that's okay. If they want to use it, fine. Right. If it makes you feel good. But like, I think it doesn't make a lot of people feel good, you know, yeah. because w people are reading these descriptions in the news of like they lost their battle or in obituaries and they're thinking, well, like <laughs> my husband like died or, right. and he, you know, like, I think he fought pretty hard. Like, I don't know. Like, uh, did he have a chance to win if he fought harder? So like, why are we right. promoting this idea of like, you have control because the truth is, is that in a lot of things that can take you down permanently in life, mm -hmm. you don't actually have a lot of control over that. Right, right. And with this, with this project in particular, the handbook, which is uh, kind of interactive, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's short, like, writing prompts and questions and a lot of space in this book for the reader to be a writer, uh, which I think is, is really cool. And I, I think a big kind of goal of modern loss generally, not just with this book, but with the, the community and may I even say movement that you've, you've created is this idea of, first of all, I know you're, you talk a lot about storytelling as a change agent, and then also this idea of letting people control the narrative, right? Yeah. And um, so I, you know, when I think about that section that you just read in particular, that's kind of the part that stays with me. And it's, even though it's not directly arguing against the losing one's battle with, with an illness or something, there is this this kind of response like quality to this idea of letting a person grieving control their own narrative around it. Yeah, I think that like, you know, our culture has this like major design flaw, <laughs> which is that we like to fix things and we're told that we can or we should always look for the solution. But there is no solution. There's no solution to things over which you have very little control. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, like you quoted from me, you know, <laughs> the, you know, like the pandemic, I mean, this pandemic has taught us this. I mean, we, I think that, that any illusion of control has been shattered, right? We all, a lot of us thought we had control. We made our long-term plans. We made our short-term plans. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a thing, we had an idea. I'm not a very good planner. So like I didn't have so many, you know, set plans, but many people did. And I think that like, you know, the pandemic happened and then we thought, okay, maybe last summer we're getting back to life. We're all vaccinated. You know, we're going to have hot, hot fact summer. <laughs> we're moving on. What's the pandemic? What's that? You know, <laughs> but then we all got Delta and then we all got Omicron and now I don't even know what's happening. And so there's, like a thousand different variants and I, I think that if, if anything has happened it's that we keep getting reminded time and again that no 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 actually like we we have to learn to live with discomfort mm -hmm. because there's discomfort in the unknown and in the lack of control and that is what grief is is like you know just you have no choice you literally cannot control it it controls you especially in those early days you're like a marionette mm -hmm. and we feel so the only thing you really can control sometimes are like the small moves you can make. And one of those moves at Modern Loss, what we encourage people to do is sharing their narrative. Mm -hmm. You can control that. You can control what you want to share with people. You can spill your guts out. Like I'm not someone who like tends to do, you know, and then this happened and this happened and everything in public, but you can share as much as you want because in this society, we like assuming that after 30 days, 60 days, a year, whatever, there are different levels of like ease <laughs> that mm -hmm. people hit. 
But we all know that's not the case now. You know, grief is this very nonlinear thing and it has endless stages that happen in any particular order. Right. And the more we can feel, feel comfortable being like, you know, actually like my mom died 15 years ago and, you know, this week was like shockingly weirdly hard because this happened, mm -hmm. you know, or I wasn't a mother when my mom died and now I'm a mom and I'm really struggling with this. The more we can kind of like buck that assumed narrative that people have about what grief is like, the more we can change how people perceive the real grief mm -hmm. experience. And by extension, not to sound like Pollyanna-ish, we can move the needle mm -hmm. on a stigma because we are all going to go through this. And I think we are all grieving now. We've all been grieving something for two and a half years, mm -hmm. even if it's not a death loss. So like, it just behooves us to get better at this. And the tough love line is kind of, it's on the people going through the tough times to kind of say, look, I, I, this, is, this is what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot in the book. Uh, you know, the book is a, I see it as a, a framework for people and you can kind of skip around um, you know from section to section you don't have to go in order some of it is you get to write and think about really funny stories relating to your grief uh, you're you're great at leveraging the levity and getting that out of other people you can also think about okay uh, I'm gonna think about what I might need you know in my workplace with regard to this I can think about you know maybe some of the you know you have a section called the tough stuff yeah. Um, where you talk about and get people to think about maybe the stuff that you wouldn't have put in a eulogy, yeah. you know, <laughs> about yeah. somebody. Um, Which I, I think is, like, even more important than remembering that they, like, you know, made, like, the most adorable pancakes, you right, know, or, or whatever. Because yeah. when someone dies, you are stuck with all the stuff. Right. There's no more contending with that person in a conversation, yeah. you you are left to figure it all out, all the unresolved things, of which there's always unresolved things because it's a human relationship. There's no like perfect closure. That's the biggest myth. You know, it's the biggest yes. myth ever. So I argue that like thinking through questions like, were there ever any ways in which like this this person never apologized for something? Do you wish you would apologize? Did they ever hurt you? Did they cause you harm? Mm -hmm. Like, was there resentment? These are things that are actually really important to think through because they're going to be in you no matter what, and it's better to get it out than in. And so I, mm -hmm. I like kind of tease these very hard things out of you in hopes that you'll kind of reflect on them and think, well, what what do I need in order to like yeah. feel better about this? Do I need to talk to a grief counselor? Do I need a group? Do I need a friend? Right. You know, I mean, because this stuff I've learned the hard way, as has the modern loss community. The body keeps the score. Yeah, you know, like yeah. you can fool everyone but your own body. Right. And. You know, we we talk about the the writer griever griever writer, however we want to hyphenate that, um, controlling their own story, which means a number of things. It, it means, you know, what do you, how do you want your story to sound? Do you want it to be funny? Do you want it to be uh, about the death? Do you want it to be about the person's life? Do you want it to be about your life after after a death? Uh, do you want to kind of zoom in on certain qualities, certain moments? But what you do is you help give us a way to control that because I think anyone with an inclination to tell their story around, really around anything, but maybe in particular something like this, you, um, you know, we, we call it around here, we call it like the fear of the blank page. You know, you open up uh, <laughs> uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Word or, you know, some people might even have a literal blank page in front of them. <laughs> uh, and it's like, OK, you know, as someone who's taught, you know, high school and college students uh, personal essay and memoir writing, there's a lot of pressure to like tell the whole story mm -hmm. in their 1200 word right. memoir <clears throat> class assignment, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh I that's a tall order you know that's something we we talk about a lot and it's like you don't have to do this all at once and this book really breaks down uh you know how to kind of just zoom in on certain certain aspects of it and skip some parts and come back and you know then there's just blank literal blank pages in here if you really do want to kind of go for it and I think having that kind of structure around it uh 
certainly is helpful for anyone, even someone who, who considers themselves a writer and maybe even who has a writing yeah. background. Yeah, I think that like, first of all, writing and memoir, it's such a personal thing, right? When you're writing, you know, um, about your own experiences, that's, that's scary. But like, it's different to write about like, you know, like just like a fun piece about like the f first pair, like why you love stilettos and like <laughs> I don't know um, I mean as long as it's not couched in something traumatizing like I would assume that that would be like somewhat enjoyable and like a nice trip down memory lane mm -hmm. and but this is like really weighty you know it can yeah. feel very overwhelming and I think that somebody looking to write like this book it's not like hey you want to be a writer do this this is not a book for like right it's a book for human people who are right. living with loss you know and that's why I know how overwhelming it can be and I'm not telling people like hey the only way you can like reflect on your experiences is by writing like the next year of magical thinking like <laughs> I don't want to do that that's terrifying to me I have exercises in here that literally ask you to come up with six total words yes because I yes. know how overwhelming it can be it can be very scary and also grief is all like it affects every facet of your life mm -hmm. and then across the long arc so it affects your identity and the choices you make and mm -hmm. you know who you want to date and what career you might want to do or like how you make decisions now it just affects so many things that you feel like you might in that 1200 word essay have to include everything but you don't like I'm trying to show that grief is all and so you got to keep it narrowly focused mm -hmm. for your own sanity I help you keep it narrowly focused because that is the way that you can see your own story forming yeah. and then reflect on it and like for me it's not just like and you can publish your book after that it's yeah. like then you can figure out how can you tease some meaning out of the shit storm <laughs> that is living with loss you know right, right. um and I want to um you mentioned this, the six word <laughs> I memoirs. thought I'd say it in a really poetic way yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the six word memoirs somewhere in this room there's a yellow chair and it's our six word memoir chair oh fun uh, so we're fans of are you Oh, Izzy's. Oh, Izzy, of course, sat oh, in the six-word memoir chair. <laughs> it's always important. Yes, yeah, so we're fans of the six-word memoir. That's great. Memoir I'm a big fan here. of those. And yeah. Yes, and I know you're friends with, is it Larry? Larry, yes. yes. Yeah. So he's great. He's from Jersey, so by, <laughs> he, you know, uh, I think Philadelphians would not consider that Philly, but in Jersey, they yes. consider that Philly. Um, yes. <laughs> my husband likes to say I'm from Jersey, by the way. I'm from oh. Bala Kimwood. And he's like, same thing. I'm like, it's, it's literally not. Um, wow. Yeah. I love Jersey. I'm just saying it's not Philadelphia. <laughs> um, right. Yet I digress. Larry Smith is a, is a great friend of mine and also just like a really cool creative person who runs a magazine called Smith Mag. And he promotes this storytelling exercise, it's, you know, structure called Six Word Storytelling. And it's based on a Hemingway short story. It's like for sale, girls' shoes never worn. And the idea is like, what happened there? Like the idea is to th like to create an intrigue. Like, wait a minute, that's a story. What is the story? Like, did she die or the sh did she outgrow the shoes? Like it right. could be anything, but you're interested. You're like, what's going on there? And then you're allowing that person to share a tiny sliver of their story without feeling overwhelmed that they have to share mm -hmm. so much that they're like an exposed nerve, right? Yeah. And so the beauty in using six word memoir for loss is that it doesn't overwhelm people, but then on the flip side, the person listening to that or reading that is gonna say, wow, I see a little bit of my own experience yep. in there. Maybe I'm gonna go, to, go up to that person, make a connection. Like right. this is how you form community, yes. you know? And it's, it's exactly what you've done so successfully if I may, uh, in, in these years with, with Modern Loss. And so, you know, for, for those who don't know, Modern Loss is a website. It's a Facebook group. Uh, it's on Instagram. Yeah. It's on Twitter. But, and then the, the first book is, a, is primarily a collection of essays about loss by all different people. Um, and, you know, and there's, uh, you know, many of them are, are humorous. Uh, you know, there's a whole different range of, of kinds of loss and everything. So it's a real, it feels like you're in a community when you're reading the book. And then what, what I thought was so, I don't know, I, I actually found it moving, I would say, looking at the second book and, and reading the second book and thinking about it, you know, you then decided, okay, so I've created this conversation that is, by by its own very nature it's inviting to you know it 
helps the reader feel like maybe they're part of the circle of, of all these stories. And then in this one, the, the reader literally becomes a writer yeah. within the book yeah. itself. And uh, that's not something that we get to do in most books. I mean, some of us, you know, going back to the English majors, we scribble our little notes and we underline and we, you know, write uh, notes on our iPhone while we're reading or something, but we don't, there isn't actually like lines in the book as there is here to kind of integrate our own story. Yeah. And, and just thinking about the communitarian nature yeah. of your work, it's I'm, so great well, that the, the, does that. The whole goal is to give an ongoing invitation to people to engage with this stuff. Yeah. And if I'm talking at you or writing at you nonstop, yeah. that's not going to happen. You're just going to be like reading my words. And mm -hmm. that's, I only know my own experience. And of course, I included so many others experiences yes. and expert, you know, research and whatnot. But like the difference between the first book and the second book is the first book was was a wide range of stories but they they we commissioned them and we edited them and they're from 40 contributors and my co-author Gabby and I wrote extensively for it but there was not an, any room for like hey what's your story mm -hmm. so this is like I'm looking at like what do you call it like the fourth wall or whatever yeah. and I'm like hey like this is my story that's her story that's theirs what's your story like by the way it's like I'm interrupting right. my own conversation mm -hmm. which I do all the time um <laughs> so I yeah. write the way I'm not like a fancy writer I write the way I speak so like I I stop a lot and I'm like well what do you think you know yes, yes. because that's the whole point is for you right. to think about as it how it relates to you and if it doesn't work in that moment I say like you like throw the book against the wall put it under your chair I don't care like let your cat sleep on it and then come back to it come back to it in mm -hmm. a month come back to it in a year who cares you know like the thing about loss is like the loss is always going to be there you right. know yes you're very I, I, I know you to be very against the, the uh, it takes a year camp. Yeah. Right? And the, isn't yeah. that in the, like, the, the it DSM? The it takes a year lobby doesn't like me yeah. very much. Isn't that yeah. in the DSM now? Like, it is. Brief, Un very brief. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, is anyone a, like a therapist here? Like, okay. So I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to say like, so there's the DSM-5, uh, which obviously is the book through which mental health profess professionals make diagnoses and then get in insurance to cover, you know, treatment of patients. Uh, this year, they included a new diagnosis called uh, prolonged grief disorder, which was previously known as complicated grief. And I hate both of those terms because first, like all grief is complicated, right, you right, know, and right, um, right. prolonged grief, like I don't even know, like who's coining these phrases but the idea is like if the idea is and in this culture like I said we like fixes we like explanations so the average person is going to read this diagnosis and say oh if I'm not okay after a year something is wrong with me um I like need serious help but like I don't know what okay is you know right. like what is okay it differs for everyone and so it really alludes to the very minor percentage like eight to ten or twelve to fifteen percent of people who are really literally unable to glean any you know enjoyment from life they're not able to work they're really not able to function well and they really do legitimately need serious help there's a lot of trauma out there that begs for serious help um however the majority of us because grief is the most universal thing it is a very natural thing for us to go through with the right supports not just individually in terms of grief therapy, but communally, if right. we can talk about it and not and live an experience that is individual but doesn't have to be so isolated. If we can live it together, then like that's how you can move yeah. through something and feel like your burden is being divided up and carried among many shoulders and yeah. not just your own. And so I don't like this prolonged grief diagnosis inclusion in the DSM-5 because it, I think it just connects to too many other diagnoses like anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and like why create a specific thing for grief? Like I yeah. don't understand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, I, I, I think I told you this earlier. I, I re-listened to your, your interview today while I was running actually. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I stalk her on Strava. So <laughs> every day I'm like, Ooh, she ran in France. Cause she always does virtual <laughs> runs. Oh yeah. And yeah. like, I just power right. walked. Down right. the street. <laughs> well, today I, today I trotted by Independence Hall, uh, <laughs> and I was re-listening. Actually, it's kind of, um, I didn't think of this, but I was listening to as, as the Philadelphians here know, uh, 
our our beloved Marty Moss Cohen of Radio Times. Yeah. Uh, you you I love Marty. Yes, yeah. you you did a great <laughs> interview with her right when the book came out in June. And now that I think of it, I was like, you know. Oh, right there. Yeah, a, a tenth of a mile from yeah. WHYY. As I was listening to this, but anyway, the, you talk about how you don't think of yourself as a, a woman who's grieving, or no. you know, but you, you, know, you talk about uh, the long arc of grief. You know, it will always be present in your life, and I, of course, uh, feel that myself. My mom died when I was 12. I am, I, that was a long time ago, uh, about 27 years ago, um, almost exactly, in fact. Um, but... You know, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't matter if it's 27 years. It doesn't years. matter. It's, it's, you know, you, I like this, this idea of the, the arc of it. And it makes me think of, of, uh, our, our pal Hope Edelman, yes. uh, who, mm-hmm. whose mo- most recent book is called The After Grief, right. which is basically also about this idea of, of grief extending through our life and always being present. And yes, you're not necessarily actively grieving, but, you you know it might pop up in different ways maybe as you said like when you became a parent and as you move through different yeah. stages of parenting I think it all points to the fact and I think it's a fact that like you don't necessarily believe early on but you come to believe it through proof right like that your relationship with your person is still there even if they're dead. <laughs> and by the way, I'm not trying to be like, it's totally fine. Like, you still have a relationship. Like, no, it sucks. They're dead. Like, I wish they weren't. <laughs> right. I wish you got to have them. But you don't. And I've learned the hard way that we can't wish it otherwise, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like you will, as you move through your life, if you're lucky to continue moving through your life, you will hit these moments where you'll be like, you'll think of your person and you know there are a lot of complicated relationships out there that aren't very positive you know in in my case my mom and I were best friends we just Mm. were and so you know I was single when she died and and then I got married after she died I became a parent and you know I'm evolving in my career and in my life and thinking Mm. like was like ranging from like wait is this it to like oh how do I balance all these things I'm excited about and I think like how did she do it what was she doing in this moment and I'm Mm. trying to remember and it's interesting interesting because like I I have noticed myself going from like a 30 year old I mean let's just call it girl you know 30 (laughs) and in New York when you're 30 and single you're basically like 12 because you're like you know you have like you're living like a you're living like in a dorm room in in Manhattan (laughs) um you know but I you just evolve into Mm -hmm. you know somebody who regards I've evolved into like a, a woman who's regarded her less not just from like daughter to mom, but like woman to woman, mother to mother, Mm -hmm. you know, career person to career person, entrepreneur to entrepreneur. It's interesting. And like it, I've like caught myself. I'm like, wow, like I really do have a relationship with her. Mm. Like it's, it's not just about like, oh, I know what she would say in any given moment. I, I don't, I think I do, but I don't always, it's more just that proof that like, wow, I'm, I'm regarding her in different ways. So like mm-hmm. it's it's a very loss and grief is a very dynamic thing. Yeah. It's never over. But the reason I say I don't view myself as like a grieving woman is because I, I think more about myself in terms of living with loss. Yeah. I feel like it controls me less now. And I expect the moments. I expect that there will be moments where I feel like I'm being owned by it. Mm. And I know that I just have to hang on through them, you know? Yeah. And to me that living with loss phrase to me gives me like a sense more of control even though I know I don't have a lot of control but it makes me feel like more of an active it feels like more of an active partnership as opposed to like I'm being owned by it yeah and you can maybe you know allow yourself to notice different aspects of it and maybe regard it with a kind of curiosity as opposed to um you know letting there are certain times obviously in in active grieving where the emotions are kind of dictating right your own you know behavior around them but whereas the, on this longer arc and uh you you can maybe you know do a little question asking interrogating being curious and that's i think goes back to that idea of controlling the narrative and also allowing yourself to change the narrative as yeah. as you move forward and as you you go on uh, and something you know we talk about in in memoir class or in personal essay class is uh, especially since I'm often working with 
people, brilliant people, uh, between the ages of 16 and 22, um, who are very eager to get the story right. And especially when it, when there are stakes like the ones we're talking about, but it's, you know, something that's, I think worth considering for them and, and for all of us is that story, uh, is going to change. You know, if you write that story when you're 16, it's going to be different. If you write a different story about it when you're 18 and when you're 20 and, you know, certainly when you're 40. Right. Um, and so, and you know, none of these people want to think about when they're 40 and I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask them to do that. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that even opening your mind up to that fact that it will, you know, the story will kind of reside in you differently and uh, resonate differently or different parts of it will uh, come out to you differently as you move through life, whether you're a writer or not. But, you know, usually we're, we're talking around here in the context of being a person who wants to put it onto the page and perhaps share it with others. And I think that uh, this concept of living with loss is helpful in that. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it helps me. I always say, like, you know, this is what helps me. You know, <laughs> it may not help you, but it helps me, you know, yeah. and you never know. I, I was very eager for, like, people to tell me what helped them, you yeah. know. And at the beginning, I just wanted something to fix my pain so badly that I would – I thought that everything that worked for everybody should work for me. And I realized quickly that that's not how it goes. Yeah. Now I'm like, oh, still tell me what works for you and I'll try it. If it doesn't work, okay, like maybe something else will work, you know, well, and, and which is what the book yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, a toolbox. It's a toolbox. So it's you kind of all of the advice you've gotten, maybe both in having the experience of having lost both of your parents, but then also getting ready to put this together and going out and consulting with experts and just, you know, doing some more active gathering uh there's a lot uh, you know you kind of channel all of that and you know and I think it's it's telling that even in the moment as we're, we're starting this this talk tonight you're like you didn't want to read the very beginning of the book which you know says a bit about yourself and I know it I know you're very used to uh it's not a privacy issue it's in this darn book that's published <laughs> um but it's just your nature to uh, to say you don't want to hear about me, and to instead kind of go in these other directions. And again, it it just speaks to your your uh, you know communitarian nature and uh, and you know a kind of selflessness, I would say, in this in this work. Which um, you know, as someone who likes memoir writing, I just don't have that selflessness. <laughs> so <laughs> I, do, I mean, like, I think it's just I think it comes from the fact that like this is not what I thought I was signing up to do in life, you yeah. know? Like, this was not my goal. I didn't right. want to, like, be a grief person. <laughs> I don't. I didn't know that you could grow up thinking you wanted to be something like that. I mm -hmm. wanted to be, like, an intergalactic DJ <laughs> and, like, also produce for CBS um, Sunday mornings, like, simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that's okay, because mm -hmm. that's a weekend job. And then, yeah. yeah, right. you just come back to Earth on the weekends. Um, and I had figured that out. Uh, but then the universe had other plans in store for me, and this happened. And so for me, it just took me a really – it's not like my mom was killed, and I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a, like a <laughs> publication about grief. Um, that's not what happened. She died in 2006. This I launched this in – November of 2013 mm -hmm. it's uh, many years went by and then my dad died too like kicker like mm -hmm. lost both parents mm -hmm. that again not my life plan but so it just became so incredibly evident to me how isolating this thing was mm -hmm. and then by extension it became infuriating and by further extension it just became exhausting yeah. and I was like god I could save so much energy by just spending less of that trying to pretend yeah. that everything is like the way that you think it is and me right. just telling you the way to, that it is, I'd like l let up so much energy. I wonder how many other people feel this way. Mm -hmm. There must be other people who are exhausted about this and also just need examples of resilience and not to be told. Like it's like you're you're a writing professor. I'm trained in journalism. Like the first rule in journalism and like you know just news reporting is like show don't tell mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like don't like tell people it's going to be okay don't tell people it takes a year like no 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 show people like show yeah. people the mess show people how you're moving through it show people how you're still struggling what's unresolved for you what questions 
you still have, what you're noticing, mm -hmm. what helped or didn't help, like show people. And so that's why I started Modern Loss because I'm just a storyteller. Like yeah. I was producing for Stephen Colbert when my mom died. That was my goal, you know, like yeah. that was my, as close as I came to God's work, you know. Um, <laughs> and so this just came out of like, not me wanting to like be it all about, be all about me, but rather like yeah. I just r knew firsthand how good it felt to mm -hmm. just let it all hang out and with the right people and in a safe way, like gauge who was safe to talk to and do it. And just that exhale, that emotional exhale. Mm -hmm. And I knew you could build community that way. And mm -hmm. by extension, when you feel like you're acknowledged, you feel like maybe you can heal a little better. I don't mean get over something that doesn't exist. Okay. I mean heal, because I don't want anyone to be like broken, right. you know, right. or feel broken. Mm -hmm. So I know that like it's really hard to heal without feeling acknowledged. Yeah. And that's what modern loss does. It acknowledges every person. Yeah. And so much that's in here is about kind of empowering the the person who's who's had a loss to have agency in how they navigate it, whether right. it's through doing this writing or whether it's about, you know, thinking actively about asking their friends for, for what they need. Um, or and, drawing boundaries, right? Yes, yes. There's a whole section on like secondary grief, which we don't talk about a lot, right? Like mm -hmm. the stuff that's like, you think that someone dies, you're like, oh shit, like they died. Oh God, I have to deal with like just that and that's everything. But what you don't realize if it, you're new to that is that like you might lose some friends or some friends might not know how to deal with you. You still right. have to probably work and pay your mortgage. You have to deal with your bosses and like office politics. Like right. how do you navigate? You know, like the goal of the book is threefold. It's to help you stay connected to your person through various sections on like ritual and memory and prompts helped you stay connected to yourself, which is through like, how do you take care of your like mental and physical well-being? How do you use like creative exercises? I don't just mean like, right. I mean like really good <laughs> creative exercises. One of which is a destructive suggestion. Like yeah. literally to like oh, yeah, we get take to, a sledgehammer. Yes, and you get to tear up a page. You do get to tear up pages <laughs> in the book. And then the third goal is to how to stay connected to the world around you. Because that's what we don't talk about enough mm -hmm. is that like you still have to stay connected to the world around you and chances are the world around you is not prepared adequately to support you. So how do you navigate a world that is, has, is, is overwhelmed enough on its own yeah. with its own stuff that like it can't, you know, intuit what you need at any mm -hmm. given moment. So how do you get what you need, yeah. you know, so that you can then in turn also be there for others? Because, you right. know, you probably want to be a good friend, a good partner, you know, all those things. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, a lot of it comes down to, I guess what, what we at the writer's house might call, you know, the precision of language. Uh, that's such a, we read poetry here. Um, so it's <laughs> thing to say, but, um, you, you know, you're proudly you and, and this book are proudly anti-toxic positivity. You're yeah. proudly anti platitudes, you know, um, some platitudes might include, you know, I can't imagine what right. that was like. It's I wrote like, an entire article about yes, that. Yes, for uh, time. Yes, uh, <laughs> that bothers me so much. Yes, and uh, I and it's like actually, I think you know, my response would be, I think you can imagine, and that's why because you you're you're, you're doing it yeah. right now, and that's why this conversation is weird. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, or like, what's your what's your favorite least, what's your least favorite favorite platitude? <laughs> oh gosh, um, I think I mean the the I can't imagine is good, but. Another one, of course, is the if there's anything I can do. Oh, yeah. That's what I definitely. With the ellipses afterwards. Right. Yeah. That's what I remember from my own experience of, of after my, my mom died. All these people, all these adults saying to 12-year-old, almost 13-year-old oh, me, if there's anything I can do. And it, I was like, what? And also, like, it, and, and also as, as a kid, I was sort of because of, in, in large part because of the circumstances around my, my mom's death, my whole thing was just, um, and also just my own coping mechanisms. It was all just about me just being like overachiever, high performer, I'm fine, that whole, that whole thing. Um, so it was like, 
you will absolutely not do anything for me. <laughs> you know, I will be doing all of the things for all of us uh, <laughs> for the foreseeable future, you know. Um, and I'm I, sure that worked out great for you. It was, yeah. well, I got, I got to come. <laughs> Luckily, they, they re, uh, reward a lot of these not actually healthy behaviors by, like, letting you into a school like this one. Oops. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it uh luckily luckily you know we all evolve i think but uh but you know still have some of the same same uh default modes but i think um you know you're you're very clear here in it's okay for the the person doing the grieving or the person having had the loss to say uh to actually be specific in perhaps what they need or you know um if you and it's interesting because even those of us who've been through it, um, you know, in some ways I, I consider myself a a good, you know, grief supporter in large part because of my own experience. But I also, you know, whenever it's unfortunately time to like comment on the, the Facebook post or the Instagram or mm-hmm. whatever, you see yourself kind of wanting to, you know, like say so sorry for your loss Mm -hmm. which is another attitude you know the the thing we all we all default to and um a a friend of the writer's house uh gianna demedio she she has a podcast about grief called so sorry for your Mm -hmm. loss which i think is a brilliant title for a a Mm -hmm. podcast uh and uh community around around loss because it is it's just you know, if you now I'm sort of a, a voyeur of this. If I see one of the, these these posts on social media, I kind of scroll through and say, "What is everybody saying?" And and you know, it's it's all the same thing, which is fine because I think seeing seeing that community is important, of course. But also, we even even the best of us, even those of us who have grieved or those of us who who've you know taken some writing classes, are at a loss for words in those moments. So I think it kind of you know this conversation in the book keeps us all honest about precision of language about trying to say you know something maybe specific maybe something specific about the the person themselves or something about you know if I didn't know so and so's mom maybe I know something about my how my friend related to her mom or how she was as you know how the family was or something like that you know and um and maybe instead of saying if there's anything you need, I can say, you know, can I bring by this particular thing to your house? Or can I do, can I, you know, help with driving somebody somewhere? Or, you know, just these these different things, um, something a little more specific. Uh, and I think that's even for, again, even for those of us who've been through this, I think it's a good reminder in here. Yeah, and I think that it also just encourages people going through the tough stuff to really just stand up for yourselves uh, and say, you know, like there's even like prompts that I, I think it, the section is, is very poetically called, this is why I'm not a teacher at Kelly Ryder's house. It's called <laughs> real and imagined bullshit. You might hear. Um, well, you could teach a TM. class called that. Though. I'm going <laughs> to, we might actually roster that for Great. the spring. <laughs> I'll get really good scores from students on, you on would. that. I would. Um, and it's just basically guiding you through, literally real and imagined bullshit that you're going to hear from the world around you from coworkers, from acquaintances from good friends like and like how you will hear stuff like that at some point like at some point someone will ask you was your mom wearing a seatbelt when they find out that she died in a car accident or they will ask you were there any signs if you know your partner took his life mm-hmm. or they will ask you you know was she sick or Mm -hmm. were they a smoker or they will say like um you can always get pregnant again you know um and like all that stuff is like I just view that as like people searching for some explanation that gives them a sense of control over that fate not happening to them like it's like oh was she wearing a civil like why are you asking me like is (laughs) is you asking me this helping you to be a, a, a support to me Like, is you having this information or is it just like voyeuristic or is it just like, are you thinking that maybe if she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, then, oh, there's an explanation for why something awful happened, then not, Mm -hmm. that's not going to happen to me. If they were a smoker, great. Okay. Wait, I'm not a smoker. I'm okay. That's not going to happen to me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, but that's just not being, a. I mean, it's just literally not 
providing meaningful support to someone. All it's doing is like drawing a line between you and them and being like, this is mine, that's yours. You go deal with it, you yeah. know? Well, and it's, it's, it's making, it's about the person asking the question, not the person you're asking. Yeah, you know, it's not it's, about, you know, yeah. And that's why, like I say, I literally guide people and say like, hey, like you can always say like, if you're at a loss for when someone says something like that to you, you can always say, why do you ask? And just like put it back on them. Mm -hmm. And chances are that person will have like one moment of reflection and be like, oh, wait, that was really like, that was a really dumbass thing to ask. <laughs> yeah. Why am I asking that? Because if they can't come up with an easy, plausible answer, they're going to realize it wasn't a great way to go. And then it's comfortable for everyone because, you know, you all you had to say is, oh, why do you ask? Like very innocently, you like cock your head and like look really innocent, <laughs> like a little parakeet, you know, or like George W. Bush. Remember when he was like, eh, like, oh, gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you could do that um, or you can just create some I challenge you to like come up with like what will you say to someone do you want to say I understand that I might be able to get pregnant again but like listen you're a good friend of mine like when you say something like that you're kind of ignoring the fact that like I'm literally grieving this thing that happened right now I'm I'm really grieving this like mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about the next thing I or I know that you know literally that I can maybe get pregnant again maybe I can't you don't know but like I'm grieving this thing right now. Mm. Like, be with me in this, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, so, programming note. I have a few more questions, but we're also going to give you all the chance to ask questions. But I would never spring that on you. So, I'm going <laughs> to, we're going to go back Fair to warning. the other thing. And then in a minute, I will ask you. So, you can, oh, you know. good at that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gears, the gears can turn. Um, but, yeah, the other thing I was, I was wondering if you could just break down a little bit for us would be, you know, like we've mentioned, you cite some different mental health professionals in here. Um, how did you go about kind of putting together that, you know, that roster, that part yeah. of the team? Um, that was easy for me because I'm just like, I selfishly seek out advice from people, yeah. from smart people a lot. And I'm like, oh, that helped me. So then I'm like, they're like one of my people. And so there's this like very, you know, informal board of advisors to Modern Loss. Mm -hmm. And I went to them for this because they've been amazing over the years. You know, there's, you know, my actually a really dear friend of mine. Her name is Priya Alpern. She's this amazing trauma therapist based in New York. And like if you're on TikTok, she's, she's got like tens of thousands of followers mm -hmm. on TikTok. I can't figure out how to do a TikTok. I've done one <laughs> and I was not sober while doing it. And I <laughs> well, looked really I weird. Do it, yeah. Right? She was like, oh, you did it perfectly. You're supposed to look like crap. It's very real. It's perfect. I'm like, oh God, I'm <laughs> really bad. Um, and so, you know, she's amazing. And like, she kind of advised me on like the trauma section, like EMDR mm -hmm. and like kind of how to explain different types of therapy to people without getting too deep and like too in the weeds. Um, I went to um, Dan Wolf who's a grief counselor he's on the uh faculty of experience camps which is this amazing nonprofit that oh, provides yeah. free camps for kids who have lost a primary caregiver I mean it's like this amazing very vibrant organization yes, yes. and he's on the faculty there um so I just you know went to a lot and then like the people who do virtual sessions for the modern loss community every month like there's a mindfulness expert Annie Pearson mm -hmm. who helps people anchor themselves in the moment through like a, a variety of mindfulness techniques Mm -hmm. There's an amazing uh, occupational therapist in Edmonton, Alberta, you know, thanks to Zoom. The pandemic brought one good thing, which is like it connected me to all these amazing yeah. people. She leads sessions from her basement in Alberta, Canada, <laughs> um, yoga for grief support, you know, so mm -hmm. like she created all these flows that can help. Um, so yeah, like talk to a sleep expert, you know, so like, yeah, these are my people yeah. and I just have been so grateful to them and I wanted them to have their due. I yeah. just wanted yeah. to kind of, send people their way you yeah know? and it's I mean it's also another first of all it's obviously another way that you're you're you know assembling these communities um and you know to our benefit basically which is wonderful and also you know it's called a handbook and I think the like it's it's almost a, it's not a, it's certainly not a platitude but it is a thing people say like isn't there a handbook for this right we're proud to say there you it. go here it is people um <laughs> I mean, the reason that i wrote it is, is is like it's it sounds like a marketing line but 
it's sure it is a marketing line, but it's literally the reason I wrote it was because right. I wish someone had handed this to me. Yeah. I want it, you know, like in Beetlejuice, like, you know, like they find themselves in the waiting room or, and then they get the handbook for the recently deceased. Um, well, this is the handbook for the, the aggrieved, yeah. <laughs> or that, not the aggrieved, like that's a different <laughs> definition, <laughs> Sorry, you're right. but the grieved, you know, mm. like the newly grieving and then the forever grievers, yes. you know, like this is the handbook and right. it's not a guidebook. It's not a how to, it's a handbook. It's a field guide. You know, mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. telling you there's no one way. There's no vaccine for this stuff. There's no mm. one way, you know, mm. there's just the 360 way. Yeah. And it's going to be different for everyone, you know? Right, right. Um, all right, the time has come. Oh, gosh. We have a wireless microphone uh, that one of our pals in the back will will join us with. Uh, who's got a question? You have a question. Here, wait for oh, the good. mic so our YouTube friends There's always, can... like, one moment where I'm like, no one's going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this has been a really wonderful talk. Um I, your book was really helpful in my own loss. Um, I lost my sister and nephew about two years ago um, oh, in an terrible. accident. So um, it was really helpful in reading through the stories and really feeling like I was part of this community. Um, I think one of the things I've struggled with is um, c- kind of interacting with people who are like not in this like shitty club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And obviously everyone's going to be in it at some point in their lives but not them really knowing what to say or not really knowing what to engage in some of the examples that you um, gave and me wanting to try to figure out how to like tell them and like bring them in. So has, have them have, are you like considering how to open up like the modern loss movement to people that like maybe haven't experienced that like acute form of grief, but yeah. like you want to like un- help them understand what that's like? Um, first Thanks. of all, that's terrible. It's awful. I'm so sad to hear about your sister and that I'm sorry that you have any reason to like relate to any of this um and yes like I think that the thought process behind modern loss is first of all the website is um like I don't view it like a blog it's not a listserv it's a publication right Mm -hmm. and like yes it's not vogue or like whatever like (laughs) the cut um but it's modernloss.com and it's a publication and I'm a journalist and my co-founder Gabby is also a journalist and we don't accept all of our pitches we probably we're like harder to get into than Harvard mostly because we don't have the resources we just have our brain power and our time and I also have two small kids I don't charge anything for the site and so we're like this has to be very good Mm -hmm. or else it doesn't have a right to exist because it's small and so it has to be really good or else why bother right Mm -hmm. and so the reason that it's so thoughtfully edited and, and curated and like we work with every writer on their piece like I don't ever take a piece and say okay I'm gonna like put it online like thanks I work really really closely with our contributors because some of them are not professional writers they just they have something that they want to say and I help them to say it because I want them to feel like they've said the thing that they have to say in a narrowly focused way and so the idea is that to make it so well done storytelling wise that it's just good storytelling good content that re- that other people are drawn into you know kind of like um humans of new york right the instagram mm-hmm. um and like what's the common denominator everybody is like human you know and they're all in new york at least the one that brandon does in new york city mm-hmm. but beyond that you have every story under the sun you have like an egyptian cobbler who's like talking mm-hmm. about his first date with his wife in cairo and now they live in like I don't know, flushing. You have like everything, right? And so, but you're like, I'm not an Egyptian cobbler, but I find his story fascinating and also learning. And I'm kind of identifying with like that piece of humor or that like Mm -hmm. intimacy thing that he talked about. And so the idea is to not, threefold for the whole modern loss movement, which is to give people a platform through which to share their narrative, to stand in their own narrative, right? So the contributors. Second is to draw other people out of their own isolation when they read these stories and they realize that they see like a glimmer of their own experience in it. You don't just have to have like lost your mom to feel a kinship to someone, you know, who like who has a different type of loss. There's like common threads through all loss, right? Um, So to create a sense of community and like make people feel less alone and encourage them to share their stories with the people around them, right? And then the third goal is to create more empathy in the world through just good storytelling. Because when you do it well, 
then you're reading a piece, you're like, wow, and you're really moved by it. And you've learned something. Like maybe you've laughed a little because we do, you know, like, I mean, I like, I mean, I worked in political satire. So like I believe in serving up very hard subjects with a dose of levity whenever possible because that's how you get messages through. You know, you can't just like bang people over the head with them. They'll never come back. So the, yes, when you read a story and you're really compelled, you're moved, you're entertained, but you've also learned. And it you you it sits with you, it stays with you. And then you think, well, maybe when I, maybe I'm going to look at that person in my life who's going through something hard a little differently. Maybe I'll say something a little different next time. Or just maybe you don't have that person in your life, but when something happens to someone around you, you've learned a little something and you're, you've changed in how you're going to provide that support, you know? And so that's the goal, which is to educate people. And there are also a lot of pieces on our website, um, you know, that are like, you know, how to's like guys there are some things that I really believe are yes do this and don't do that <laughs> you know for for people who are you know offering support yeah, yeah. thank you yeah you're welcome other questions oh Zelda Zelda hello Ooh. hi <laughs> uh yeah we have an online one here oh, um oh, hello. very nice I don't know where the camera is not the camera Up, I can't here, I'll stand over here somebody two. move the camera <laughs> So it can be on me. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, shit, I need to read. <laughs> yeah, I was like, do, do yeah, you remember? Yeah, my memorize? bad. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca and Jamie Lee, first of all. Hi. Hi. Um, and this is from Paul Vanelli. Oh, Paul is a, a pen and writer's house alum. Oh, so that's exciting. Very nice. Hi, Paul. <laughs> um, it says, thank you for this meaningful conversation. Do you feel grief evolves from loss to loss? Are early losses transformed by later ones and vice versa? And then that's the question and they said thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for the question, Paul. I don't even know where to look. I'm like, like, like thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks for the question, mm. Paul, and thank you for watching the conversation. Um, I think that that's a very individual answer. Um, I, you know, like Jamie Lynn, her mom died when she was 12, you know, mm. so you have to go through a lot of like grief over what you never got to have with her. You know, there are just so many different things. I don't know whether other losses you've had since then and how your mom's losses inform those lost experiences. But, you know, I would say for me, the two like earth shattering ones in my life and I have lost friends, but like my mom and dad dying four years apart from each other with those were the biggies I would say till now. Um, and I would say that my mom's death for me was like, uh, it was, it was very like, it was just like the whole foundation of my world was yanked out from under my feet. You know, like everything that was steady felt like it was unsteady. Like it felt like I was like walking in rubble because I didn't recognize anything anymore. Like she was like my person in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like for me and someone, you know, like I think losing a mother is a, it's, it's a very primal loss, you know, um, for anybody. Um, and uh, it was very hard for me to just uh, have to figure out how to, speak different languages with everybody else around me because of her her absence like I had to learn how to like relate to my dad in a different way because there was this hole this personality mm -hmm. hole that didn't exist anymore you mm -hmm. know and mm -hmm. different family members and whatnot and that was really hard and I would say that when my dad died um I that was like a very hard loss too because I was really close with him like he was kind of a pain in my butt but in like a loving way <laughs> we were both very very um, stubborn situation. and you know and mm -hmm. witty um and so mm -hmm. um we uh, that was like I would say a real existential thing because mm -hmm. I was like both my parents had died and I was 34 and I didn't have kids and I was just like what this is very weird yeah, like I yeah. I feel very untethered from every like I don't feel like I belong to anything right now mm. it's a very weird feeling and I would say yeah for me that second that loss was for me very existential like right. where's my place in the world you know right, right yeah the implications and I think if I if I can jump in um and I think you know, like I was saying earlier about having having lost my mom when I was twelve, like, you know, I haven't I haven't had another another big one, but uh, I've certainly had loss, and I've also through my work here have experienced loss of some some students I've worked with, uh, and um, I think 
I think one of the things that that comes up or that happens is, you know, they 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 the the professionals will talk about the idea of cumulative grief, meaning that you kind of when you go through another loss, it the the prior losses are there and you know uh, stewing in in the mind. But I also think, you know, I mentioned also having a writer's sensibility. You're sort of an observer, journalist. You're an observer, so you're noticing everything, um, you know. And I was certainly like like that when I was 12 going through it. So then in later losses, you also are just maybe hyper aware of the different, of the different, you know, the different grief vibes going on around you, how different people are handling it, how different, how there might be some tension between say family members or others, how different needs maybe are or aren't being met. And I feel like the more, observing of these kinds of things you've done the more aware you are which perhaps isn't all that soothing (laughs) you know when you're actually uh you know feeling feeling it in the thick of it you know so um yeah that's something something that i'm thinking of zelda again is it you or is it another youtube no it's it's me it's you okay yeah (laughs) um well i guess uh for clarity's sake um, I'm one of the students you're talking about. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, not big on the whole um, uh, grief in public shtick, but um, I guess, so for me, you know, I also lost both parents. Um, uh, my mom died when I was 13, and then my dad left when I was 16, and I had the same impulse as Jamie Lee, which was to just, you know, do everything over the top and land in a place like here. Um, and I was rewarded <laughs> for that <laughs> strange behavior. Um, and then I, I just found it interesting, um, Rebecca, when you were talking about um, uh, like long grief um, or something like that, because in the DSM-5, um, they have something similar uh, they they have P, they have PTSD but they don't have CPTSD they don't have they don't recognize complex uh, PTSD um, and I thought that was really interesting because you know I talked about my therapist and I was like I think I have PTSD and she was like well no but you have this <laughs> other thing but I can't do anything about it because it's not um, you know diagnosed and so I guess two s- sort of small questions for you I wonder um, Rebecca how you feel about like the label of diagnosis and diagnoses um, and how that affects you and your writing. And then I guess um, for Jamie Lee, I was wondering like how you resist that impulse um, a little bit or like I guess just any advice to a young person that is still struggling with that impulse. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm, that's, I'm so... I'm so sorry to learn about your mom and your dad. That must be, I can only imagine that gave you a lot of material to bring to <laughs> Kelly Writer's House. You're probably one of their star writers. Um, so that is a star for many reasons. I, but yes. I mean, duh. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Can you l- just look over there? Um, <laughs> but when it comes to labels, I mean, look, again, I'm not a mental health professional. I, I never should be. I'm a writer, <laughs> you know, who has an opinion and who knows what personal loss is. So like, I guess in that case, I am a grief expert, just like everybody who has grief is a grief expert. Um, but, you know, I understand that in our culture, we just don't have really good um, health care situation and you need a diagnosis in order to justify it so that insurance will pay for it and you can get the treatment that you need. So that is just kind of the way that we are set up here um, when it comes to labels. I mean, I, I guess I just feel like I understand like PTSD um, is a, I, I personally actually had it after my mom was killed in a, a car accident. I didn't know that for a year. I didn't realize that um, until I finally you know, spoke to the right person Mm -hmm. and she was like, do you, you know, this, this is going on. Right. And like, it's normal in the sense that like, there's nothing you can do. Like you can't like will it to not be Mm -hmm. so you just need some help. Um, and it's normal that you would. Um, so I think labels are helpful in that sense to help you understand like what is going on. But when it comes to, to grief, I just think that we're just in danger of, um, you know, of like watering down 
the a, a description of what grief is. It's such a nuanced thing. Grief is such a nuanced experience. I mean, it's a li- I always talk about it as a living dynamic thing because you're alive and it's a relationship with someone else that's going to be totally different from the grief that even the someone in the same family is feeling over that person because they had a different relationship. They have different memories. They have different like, you know, status with that person. And so I think that there's a real, you know, danger in like coming up with like just a grief diagnosis like mm-hmm. I, I shining a light on grief in um you know um there's a danger in pathologizing it mm. because I just think that we go in the other direction at a time where we're at well over a million deaths from COVID alone in the United States and I think the real number is probably even closer to like probably like fi- one one and a half million now if you look at like the normal death rates over the years um and like who knows what's been going on during the BA5 you know with not reporting enough right. um that's just to COVID you know yeah. like the people are still dying for a lot of other reasons and we're at this like tip of the iceberg of a grief pandemic that is going to well outlast the viral pandemic. And Mm -hmm. so it bothers me that we're like kind of creating these categories that pathologize it in some people's minds because we all have grief. Like it's just, it's not like, I I just think you should go in the other direction, Mm -hmm. which is like, hey, grief is a very normal thing. What are some things that you might be struggling with? Is it anxiety? Can we look to the anxiety disorder? You know, is it depression? Can we look to that? You know, we don't have to just create like the grief category. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think to, to weigh in as well, you know, sort of like you qualified, I, we understand, I understand there are reasons why, you know, specific labels, specific diagnoses exist and should exist and bureaucratically need to exist, you know, in different ways. But I think from the, from the writing perspective um, and the, the writing, you know, about and around one's own grief, I think, yeah, maybe trying to resist uh, over, over labeling or Mm -hmm. over identifying as something, because that's when as a writer, you start to fall down the, the cliche, you know, hole. Uh, And, you know, so to, you don't want to too easily affiliate yourself or affiliate your loss with others, you know, that might, might be like it. Um, And I know, I know that's something I've felt in my own, in my own writing, um, certainly. And I think, you know, also in terms of just general advice for, for you and others, like, as we've discussed, just also kind of be open to the way the story changes Mm -hmm. over time. And, you know, Zelda, something you and I have talked about is, uh, you can write about it. You can also write about the contents of your backpack, which you did once. Uh, you can write about something completely different, or you can write about grief uh, or the loss in a way that it came up and completely surprised you, or in a way that uh, you know maybe it comes up, but it's kind of playing in the background, um, or it's it's you know uh, one of my one of my favorite dead parents uh tv shows right now is never have i ever uh Mm -hmm. where you know her dad died but every it's not like it's uh, like the more the drama of that show is like davy and paxton will Mm -hmm. they won't they you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh but every once in a while we see that that dad loss come back you know and really i think moving ways for uh, for a comedy they did especially in that last they really did it well in that last season totally Yeah. yeah fun fact my friend kabir akhtar fellow Lower Marion High School grad, Philly native, is the director of that series. Oh, my so goodness. Oh Philly my goodness. mainline kid, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So I think, like, seeing, you know, as a storyteller, you can also see where, you know, dropping a little a little grief in, <laughs> uh, maybe even as kind of a, a backstory situation, see how that works in a story, whether in maybe even in your own, if you're writing about yourself or if you're doing fiction or some other kind of writing, you can just see see how it kind of propels the story in other ways. Like every piece of that concerns a loss doesn't have to be a loss story or a grief narrative, you know? So I think, and I think you'd be a great person to do that experimenting in, in your work. And I actually just want to add quickly, because I'm looking at the time. I know that you guys yes. have been sitting for a while. But um, that is the, the whole point of modern loss is, like, you look on the site and 
choose any story and it's not like death, 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 free, 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 free. Like a lot of these stories are about like things that are just like tangential to grief, but it's understood that they're all happening against the backdrop of, Hey, there was a loss here. Mm -hmm. Like never have I ever, it's like, Hey, are they going to do it or not? Like, you know, (laughs) but it's really like she's having, she, she's got daddy issues because of this awful thing Mm -hmm. that happened to her father. And so, but 95% of the story or the narrative arc is like, you know, dating and high school drama. And like, that's what you find on modern loss. It's not just like the lost story. It's the story of my life. Mm -hmm. And like, who am I now? You know, and it's happening against the backdrop of this happened to me a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe you'll write for us one day. I was was about to ask. Just FYI. Yeah. Um, Send in a piece. (laughs) So last question. Uh, You know, I got to shout out Never Have I Ever. Are there other grief stories, grief in art, things you've been reading, watching lately that that are worth a, a shout yeah. out? Sure. I mean, everyone like they they all they're like, oh, you're like the grief queen. I'm like, oh, am I? Like, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, um, I everyone assumes that I watch like This Is Us every day, but I actually don't. I've watched like one episode, and I was like, this is so sad. Like, I can't do it. Like, I just. I'm not, I like laughing. I, yes. I also deal with grief. Like I help people write stories. So like, I, I actually like watching really dumb shit on TV. <laughs> like I'm really into Cobra Kai right now. I'll like turbo watch it. Um, and uh, really good right now, but really nice throwback um, series. But, um, you know, but so I, I don't tend to veer toward like the really heavy stuff. Like, mm. and I'm sure This Is Us is very entertaining and like lovely, cheesy and all that and really well done. I just couldn't do it. Um, I love, I mean, cliche, but like, I, I'm sorry, I love Fleabag. I think it's oh, like yeah. the best grief show I've ever seen in my entire life. Mm-hmm. It's a work of genius. Mm-hmm. And I will stand by that. I think it's genius. Yeah. Um, and I could quote lines all the time <laughs> from her. And she just got it right every single time. I just am in love with her and her writing and everything. Yeah. Um, I will then tw- give it a little twist to you. I think never have I ever has done a great job. Sorry. I won't quote like Joan Didion and Cheryl Strait, like mm-hmm. all that. Cause you all know that they exist, but there is a show on Netflix. If you're looking for like a little palate cleanser, um, it's a animated show called human resources. Do you know, it's like the people who did big mouth. It's all comedians. Uh, it's like, um, uh, Nick Kroll, mm-hmm. you know, um, like it's like all these really well-known comedians and it's um, animated and there's I think it's episode nine look at it and it's called this like it's almost over or something like that it's it's episode nine and it's about grief and it's these animated characters that are the human resources are actually like feelings that accompany their people they're they're meant to help the people um, through big things yeah. but it's like really potty mouthed and like super body <laughs> and just like it's very funny yeah. um, you like don't realize you're watching something very profound because it's like full of obscenities um and so there's this um episode where the grandmother of someone is dying it's all animated and there's this um character keeps popping up and his name is Keith from grief and (laughs) his name he's like I'm Keith from grief who by the by is played by Henry Winkler so you can only imagine how awesome that is and he's like a sweater he's a grief sweater and I won't give it away but it is the most well done and well done episode on grief I've ever seen one singular episode oh, man. which is like I won't even use some of the words they use and I can't even like and I use obscenities in public I can't even say the stuff that they say here but it's so well done it's so spot on and you you end that episode and you're like how the hell did they get that so right yeah. in this uh, show and I recommend it to everybody like everyone who wants to learn what grief feels like and who wants to feel seen in it Mm. it did the trick that's awesome um I'll give one last quick shout out and there's a modern loss connection um there's a new comedy special comedy show on Peacock oh yeah that's called no bad days and the the comedian is Alyssa Lim Paris uh who I first started following, thanks to Izzy, who's back there, uh, and not for grief reasons, but for uh, Massachusetts uh, native reasons. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, she does a great <laughs> shtick does, with yes. her mom. Yeah, she her her mother sounds like my auntie Mary. She, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, She's she funny. she has the and I actually got to go. I went to the taping uh, oh, nice. in New York, and uh, she does this. You know, really really interesting comedy, but also sort of personal narrative, grief narrative, uh, you know, hour long special and, and modern loss, I believe was like the first we were, place to publish. I was the first person to publish yeah. Alyssa ever. Amazing. Yes. Ever. I, yeah. Um, she graduated from Brown. She emailed me and she's like, my dad just died. I really like your website. Like I have something to say. And I was like, say it. And she wrote <laughs> this piece and I, she blew me away. Yeah. And then she wrote like two, uh, pieces over in the future over the following years and um so I love Alyssa and I've been in her corner the whole time and as she's awesome. developed the show I've been just so moved by how yeah. she's done it and I went to I was in the Berkshires yes, in the yes. winter and I saw when she was developing the show I got to see her and we were just like hugging and crying and you know she's 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 an awesome girl first of all but like just to see what you can do like I always say like you don't have to be like the next Joan Diddy and then you don't even have to do a one woman show about grief that ends up being bought by Peacock <laughs> but like what she did what the pain that she went through mm -hmm. of caring for her father and watching him die and moving home and then being so lost and turning it into something so brilliant like that is that is the definition of like resilience you know mm -hmm. like she she pulled some meaning out of this yeah you know well and it's you know in conclusion it's such a perfect example of how you then helped shepherd her and her story along and that is yeah. what you do <laughs> my friend um so thank you for helping her thank you for helping everyone thank you for being here thank you all for being here and let's give rebecca a round of applause thank you for coming um, so we do have, we have both books. They are $13 each. Literally, they, I will say they're the deal of the century. Yes. They're like 24 bucks. Yes. Sticker price. Yes. We, we take, so like buy uh, the book. They have a lot we're of very copies. bad at capitalism here at the Kelly writer's house <laughs> proudly. Uh, but <laughs> you're, you're welcome to, to go grab a book. There are stickers in the back. We also have a reception, some snacks. And, uh, I think maybe a good idea would be if you want to stay for snacks, we can all kind of move out to the patio. Uh, for snack eating, and Rebecca might even sign your book yes. if you if you'd like. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm stuck in. <laughs> I might need to like. Pull, okay. <laughs> I know I can never like touch the floor. I just felt like a small child. Oh, <laughs> that was so beautiful. Yeah, that was great. So thank you. That was really nice. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you again so much. Oh. Actually, um, we connected on Twitter this summer. I wrote a piece called Grieving in the Pandemic. It came out in the Rolling Stone Journal. Yes. Oh my God.